Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lello. And it is just three of us this week. We're going to be talking, we're going to answer a lot of questions actually that have been kind of stacking up in the, uh, in the inbox there. So hopefully there'll be things that are useful for everyone. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my launch that I had uh, back at the end of December into January. Uh, I talked briefly about it right when it was going on. So I'm going to kind of give the two months update with some numbers for those who are curious about how much you spend, how much you made, that kind of thing. But um, guys, do you have any news? Do you want to jump in first before I start boring everybody to tears? Well, my my big news is just I've got my very first ever two audiobooks in production, and I was just going to pick your brain, like I was telling you a little bit earlier, is, is audio narration for these things are, I mean, are most narrators typically slow when it comes to audiobooks? Like, I know you guys each have had audiobooks and audio titles. Are your narrators typically talk slow? I mean, I, I lurch slow? <laughs> Um, for me, I've had a number of different series done with different narrators. I'll, you know, when, when a producer, publisher does them, I don't necessarily get to pick. Sometimes I might get a little say. And I've, I've had the range. I have some that I really like and that, you know, I think they're normal. <laughs> they talk normally. But I, I was saying, you know, I have had one where I thought it was really slow and it's interesting because she's won awards and some people really like her. So I think some of it too is just your own what sounds good in your head and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, for mine, I actually, there's several of my audiobooks that I have not listened to because they were produced by a, a traditional publisher and they didn't give me the option or requirement to proof listen to them. So uh, I don't particularly like hearing my words spoken out loud for some reason. It makes me feel uncomfortable. But the ones that I have listened to, both of them tend to be a little bit more of a performance, like they were, they were sort of doing character voices a bit. So their performance varied by character. But I found there was an emphasis on diction, but I haven't had them be, I, have, it, I did not make the observation that they were particularly slow. Yeah, I, I've noticed with mine, you know, that the first one, he, uh, my mystery, he's much farther through it than the fantasy one is. And, and I notice each chapter keeps popping up and I, I doesn't require any sort of feedback, but I like listening to it. And one thing I've noticed when I'm listening to my own book is, dude, it makes me want to go to sleep. It, it puts me, gets me drowsy. I'm like, this can't be good. <laughs> that it, My own stuff is boring the hell out of me. I don't know what about that. But And the last question I have for you guys about the audiobooks is, when you're listening to the narrator, obviously he only changed her voice, created a persona to come up with a, a different character voice there. Have you ever disagreed with how he actually phrases it? Like, for instance, if he's getting ready to voice uh, the male person number two and he makes it too gruff or makes it uh, some other characteristic that you don't like. I mean, have you ever had to correct them on it or are you just like, yeah, well, you know, it's, he, he's the narrator. Let him have his own creative influence on it and let it drop. I think uh... – before they start going, it's probably a good idea to, you know, and usually they'll ask you, right? Like, do you have any pronunciation or any tips for how I should do this one? I had a narrator do uh, one of my characters and kind of, a, he kind of had a gay sound to him, you know, like the typical Hollywood idea of what a gay man sounds like. And I mean, it was okay because the character was flamboyant and stuff, but that would be a case maybe like that where I was like, well, maybe that was a little more over the top than I needed. But you can would that, would definitely... Would that be a certain character from your Emperor's Edge series? Yes. Okay, I know the one you're talking about. The one who buys all the hats. <laughs> yep, that would be the one. I don't know why she went there with that, but you know. <laughs> but no, but I mean, in general, I usually let them have a lot of leeway. Then I've found that they usually do a pretty good job of kind of picking out... Yeah, a a ACX is actually now recommending that before you, know, before you approve the first 15 minutes, what do they say? Like, like fill out with their like director sheet. Like for, for a character one, here's how you say their name. Here's any little quirks, characteristics. And I pretty much got them all, all on all the uh, pronunciation. So that part's not a problem. Roughly what their background is. But this is wondering if, you know, if, if you're listening to them going, hmm, I never would have taken that approach. But you know, it's not bad. It's just, it's different than what you originally envisioned in your head. Uh, in my case, uh, again, the ones I haven't listened to, I don't even know. <laughs> but the, uh, the ones that I set up through ACX, uh, well, one of them, uh, I hired someone who had worked on three traditionally published ones. So all of the voices were set in stone, but I, or, I really liked the choices that she had made regardless. And the other one, it was a book that was basically just two characters. So I just gave a fairly explicit description of what the character should sound like. And both of those characters spoke during the audition. So I knew how she was going to do it. So. I didn't have any 
trouble like that. But but the other stuff hopefully came out okay. I'm getting good reviews on them. <laughs> so well, that's good. Then, at least. Yeah, you'll All have right. to let us know how how sales go when you release them. I'm still still waiting to hit it out of the park with something with ACX. Uh, my pen name series I did last year. That's probably been the best out of the gates, and it makes sense because I got the first one out within a couple of weeks or a couple of months of getting the first uh, ebook out, so it was still selling selling pretty well. But um, in general, I'm kind of like I know they'll earn out, but it's taking a while. I'm doing my backlist stuff, and uh, Podium Publishing has most of my newer stuff, so I guess they do okay because they keep asking for more books from me. <laughs> and I mean, I make money, but we've talk to people that have gotten like six figures a year from their audio books and I'm like, Ooh, I am not there. <laughs> why, why am I not there? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah. I just noticed that when mine might see my first one's going to do is, is the mystery is going to be finished. I'm actually going to come up with a box set for the first three mysteries and then time it to be released. That when the, when the audio book's going to be done, same type of thing with the fantasy is actually going to be done in, in, in April. I'm going to do the same thing, get release a box set for the first three and correspondent with the like, exact same time that audio book goes out. So I could do a little bit of uh, advertising there. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, as for news for me, um, I, when I came back from the Oregon coast thing, one of the things I decided that I was going to try was uh, putting out a short story for 99 cents once a month on the same day. And uh, I've released today, actually it's the 27th is when I've been doing it. So the second one went out today and the third one went on pre-order. Um, so far it's been a little bit hit or, hit or miss. The first book did okay. The second book did much better. Like I think I had sold, I had a, a three times as many pre-orders on the second book than the first, which hopefully is indication that it is gaining traction, but 99 cents, it's hard to make a tremendous amount of money on it unless you're really selling a lot of them. Um, how long it's, is it? It, well, that's that's the other thing is is the first two were about twenty thousand words because they were the, they were the that's longest there were novellas not even, so twenty nine nine cents for a novella is, is reasonable, but the one that's coming out next it I didn't have anything else that was in the twenty thousand word range, so at first I was like most of the rest of my stuff is eight thousand words, and I feel like eight thousand words is thin for a ninety nine cent release and I asked online and that was the general tenor of the response was that ninety nine cents is a little bit too much for eight thousand words. Um, so I'm, I, I doubled them up. This, the ones on pre-order now is two 8,000 word stories with about 16,000 words. And I don't want to go less than 15,000. I've decided that 15,000 is my hard limit on, on something I'm going to charge for. Uh, and as a result, uh, my feeling on this is basically, I probably wouldn't do this again if I had to do all of the work from scratch. As it is, I'm basically just taking stuff that I already had and releasing it. These were all newsletter perks to start off with. So there's really no effort. There's the cost of the cover, but some of these were covers that I'd had for a while. Uh, but if I was coming from scratch, I would probably focus on something I could sell for $2.99. The 99 cent thing, even if it's a spectacular uh, uh, release for me, it's, it's going to have a hard time actually making a dent in terms of actual income. Yeah, that's I where used I to right do... Now. I used to do more short stories and that was kind of my thoughts too. Even if you sell like a thousand of them, it's sort of like, wow, $300. <laughs> I mean, and then you had to pay for editing and a cover. So I, I tend to use them now more for like, I've done a couple uh, this year on my, just putting them on my blog for free. And I might, uh, once I have three, like with the same set of characters, I might bundle them and sell them. But I also like, the shorter stuff I feel works well for newsletter bonus stuff uh, with these short stories. Like I haven't really been writing any sci-fi since I've been doing a fantasy series, but I, I did a sci-fi short story. So it gave me some, a reason to email my sci-fi list and be like, Hey, here's something new. And you know, you can have it for free, which people are always excited about. <laughs> but the nice thing about doing it on your blog is people usually ask, they like want a copy for their Kindle. So you can then later still sell it for 99 cents or bundle it and, if you want to, they'll buy it because as long as it's on your blog, unless they like copy and paste it all into a word file and convert it themselves, which is a lot of work for 99 cents. You've gone on record quite a few times saying you don't ever mess with your blog or your, your website anymore. Did you do a redesign or you just started adding new material to it? Um, I stopped blogging about the self publishing stuff. And uh, there was like about a six month gap where I didn't post anything. That's when I was doing the Ruby series and I did like six books in a row and pretty much ignored <laughs> my own stuff for that time. So I'm back kind of working on my stuff. So that's why I've started posting things again. And since I talk about self-publishing on here now, that's sort of my outlet for it. And I don't really want to write posts on 
<laughs> what's going on there. There's plenty of people doing it now. When I got started, there were only a handful of people blogging about it. But um, that's my thoughts with the short stories. Did you have anything more on that, Joe? Or shall I talk release stuff? Uh, no, I guess the only other thing that is handy about this, again, well, most of these were newsletter perks going back to like three years. But I found that particularly because the one I just put out the is in the uh, sci-fi series. I haven't done a release in the sci-fi series in going on two years. So this was like, I, I have discovered how many of my fans were really looking forward to that. And this is, I suppose, a way to sort of reset the clock on the expectation because now there has been a sci-fi release and it's featuring some of the more popular characters. There's going to be another sci-fi release probably in two months. So there's that aspect to it. But again, if I could just pump it up to like 40,000 or 50,000 words and make it a 299 thing, then it would just be a better choice, I think. Right. And that actually can help too. When you go to the list and say like, here's this free short story. Oh, and then by the way, the characters in this short story, in case you didn't know, are in these novels that are for sale at Amazon or in my case with the sci-fi one, I had a story with the same characters in an anthology that just came out. So it's kind of like, you know, if you, if you want to see more of these characters, here's this two ninety nine anthology you can buy. And so that was my little bit to, <laughs> to plug the anthology because I hate just coming in out. Oh, I haven't talked to you in six months. Could you buy this from me, please? especially when it's an anthology and it's not like I'm going to make much money from it. You know, I, I got my payment for the short story, but uh, it's not like I'm going to make thousands of dollars from uh, selling these books myself. But um, yeah, so I think that's kind of a sneaky way to, <laughs> to do a little advertising, but if they uh, read it and don't want the book too, that's fine. They got something out of it and I got a story to put up. Maybe somebody will stumble on it later. <laughs> All righty. I guess I'll, talk about my launch a little bit. This is the Heritage of Power series, a five book series. Uh, I've launched four of them. The fifth one will be coming out in another couple weeks. I did the first one. This is fantasy. This was started as a trilogy, <laughs> as these things do. And it was actually not really meant to be like a big push to, oh, I hope these are going to become bestsellers. I was just like, okay, I need to get back into fantasy mode. And these characters have been kicking around in my head for a bit. So I'll start with a trilogy. And as some of you remember when I talked about this, I don't know, eight weeks ago, I was like, this launch is not going well. <laughs> it's, uh, the pre-order got messed up because I put it out too early. The covers didn't come in as quickly as I wanted, so I couldn't really uh, set up advertising on ENT and, and the sites that will take a pre, you know, like you can book them for a new release to launch the first week. But I, I did some Facebook, Amazon, and BookBub ads, pay-per-click kind of stuff, or whatever they are, pay-per-view, <laughs> whatever we decided when we interviewed the experts. So I'll talk about how much I spent on that stuff. And I did get a boost from um, having some people mention in their newsletters. Like, I don't think any huge fantasy gurus or <laughs> sellers mention it, but like a lot of newer authors were kind enough to mention it when I, I plugged their books on my site. Uh, like they're free and Kindle Unlimited books in exchange and then I uh, plugged that to my newsletter so we each got something out of it and uh, the end result was uh, book one let's see the launch dates I did the first three and launched them kind of back to back book one December 25th came out book two December 9th, 29th book three January 8th and book four January 28th and if I'd been really on the ball, book uh, five would be out now. <laughs> what is today? Uh, February 27th, because I, it's just about that 30-day cliff, you know, between releases. But um, it, and everything actually ended up, despite me saying being all depressed and like, oh, this is gonna suck. Uh, it went into Kindle Unlimited, so that helped exclusive with Amazon. Uh, aside from the folks that got it through Patreon early. First book in January. I, I didn't. I just grabbed this stuff from January for you guys' curiosity sake. Uh, first one, Dragon Storm made, this was a 99 cent book, so it made $1,660 uh, in sales in the US in January, 540 pounds. The second book was at 499, made $8,200 in the US, 200, 2,200 pounds. Uh, Origins, the one that uh, came out on the January 8th, made $8,500 US and 2,300 pounds in January. And actually, February, it's it's just now fallen off. Book one, I looked today, and is like 500 something in the rankings. It actually did hold up there in the 200s for quite a while. 
uh, getting up into the hundreds briefly. I should mention these are kind of epic fantasy, swords and sorcery-ish. So I feel like for that genre, that's really pretty good. Um, we've talked about before on the show how kind of the Earth-based, you know, urban contemporary fantasy or the sci-fi that starts out on Earth with human, or, you know, characters from our times tend to be a little easier of a sell and just kind of have a larger potential audience. It's not you don't have to be quite as into fantasy and sci-fi and, and worlds far, galaxies far, far away to pick up those kind of books. Um, but I should say the page reads were actually, I think I made more from the page reads and the sales are about the same. Uh, book one had, no, let's see, the total for all of my U.S. page reads in January were 6.3 million. And this is for these three books was about 5.3 million of that. The rest was my Ruby stuff. And um, a little, I still have an old sci-fi series with three books in Kindle Unlimited. For those who are curious, that 5.3 million under my name was enough to get the bottom rung of the all-star bonus of $1,000. Uh, I've heard tens of millions of page reads to get up into the higher tiers of that. So, uh, you know, I don't have everything in KU, so I'm never going to see those. It's only when I have a really something in the there that I, I get those bonuses. Um, and in case you didn't know, too, if you have multiple names, they don't add them together. Or if you're collaborating, I've heard, each combination of authors, they treat it as a separate entity. So you need to, whatever, you, if you want to make those bonuses and you care about that, um, you got to do it all under one name or one collaboration. Uh, also had 1.5 million to the UK. I was telling Joe earlier today that proportionately, if you look at the populations in the UK versus the US, I actually sell better in the UK, which I thought was interesting. Obviously, they have good taste. Um, 2.5 million total page reads just for book one, uh, 1.8 million in the US. And um, I got a UK bonus too, 500 pounds for total reads and then 100 pounds for one of my books. Uh, and again, in case you're curious there, the top one, I think the one the book was for got about 330,000 page reads, but the second highest book, 300,000, did not get a bonus. So that's about where it is right now. And uh, as we talk in February of 2018, I've definitely noticed and heard from other people that it's getting harder and harder to, to get those bonuses. Some people are out there just getting tons of page reads. And there's some people doing tricky stuff too, as I'm sure you've heard about. Uh, Book two had 2.1 million page reads, 1.5 million of those in the U.S. Origins book three had 2.2 million, and these were not all the same length, so <laughs> it's kind of hard to gauge just on uh, that. Um, but so, so how much did that make? Okay, so total for the U.S. in page reads, 6.3 million pages ended up being $28,500. Uh, like I said, that's not all from this this series, but it's mostly from these books. And the total for the UK was 1.5 million page reads, which was 5,100 pounds, around $700 US. Um, so these three books total in the grand scheme of things in January accounted for about $77,000 of income. And um, plus I had a, another series doing real well thanks to a book club. So it ended up being kind of like my second highest earning month ever out of a series that I didn't think was going to do anything, so I'm very pleased about that. Uh, like I said, it helps to have a book bub, but this series dwarfed what was going on because of the book bub on another series. All right, uh, last thing, I talked about the All-Stars, that's about the last thing. Okay, how much did I spend? There's the big question, right? Uh, for me, each book, when I get, you know, between editing and artwork runs about $2,000, so times three. Um, I did have the fourth book come out at the end of the month. That didn't count much towards the total earnings, but uh, about $2,000 for each book for cover and editing. And then advertising, I've been willing to spend more on advertising launches lately, in part because it seems like you have to spend more. <laughs> As we've kind of been seeing more and more people on the show, yeah, I spend a couple thousand a month on uh, <laughs> my book one advertising. But, and part of it, I'm just, I'm willing to experiment a little bit and see what works. Uh, in this case, I tried AMS ads, Amazon ads, and I spent about $800 there. And I have to say, this is the first time I managed to spend that much. Uh, whatever, for whatever reason, this cover got better clicks and I guess more buys and more impressions and such than other stuff. I know it's not my ad writing ability because that's non-existent. Uh, and I still, I see people who do a lot better with uh, 
the A costs <laughs> being under 100%. I've never managed that with a 99 cent book. And I think I was in the 150% for 99 cent book this time too. But um, considering there were more books in the series and that doesn't count KU stuff, I, I was fine with that. Facebook, honestly, was kind of a waste of money for this series for me. You know, even though you're not supposed to, I use affiliate links to see how many sales actually come from those Facebook ads. I'll eventually get kicked out of the program, but it's such a small income. I don't, you know, care. I really just want to know, like, are these ads useful? And so I spent about $1,000. I did manage to get some ads kind of using Michael Cooper's method, which we've talked about on here before, doing them from a page that's not your author page and using a picture of, like, a dragon instead of the cover art. So I managed to get those down to, like, 11, 12 cents a click, which for me was pretty good. But... You know, and I, I certainly sold some books that way and I don't regret it because I think, you know, if you can sell quite a few of those first couple weeks, it does help because uh, these did sort of stick after a while because I could turn off all my advertising after the first couple weeks. It's like it's either going to stick at that point or just you know, go down. I did leave the AMS ads on, you know, uh, so that's kind of the one thing since they were working. So that's still going. I'm not spending a whole lot. Uh, I'd probably have to do some new ads and start things up maybe to kind of kick up, get a little more impressions and clicks and stuff. And I don't know if I will. I'm about to publish the fifth book in the series. So with me, I just write quickly and move on to the next thing. Uh, I will do like box sets and, and try to get book bub ads on these in the future and that kind of thing. It's not like, you know, they just stop earning once you turn off the ads. Well, one hopes that's not the case. February was actually still a really good month for me, even though here at the end of the month, things have, have sunk a lot. Um, I think I mentioned, uh, or before the show, that it's down to, like, book one's down to, like, 500 or something in the store, which is, it's still not that bad. But I, I definitely noticed, oh, income's trickling in a little slower now. Um, but so Facebook was about $1,000, AMS ads about $800, and BookBub PPC, boy, you can spend a lot there quickly, and uh, <laughs> I spent $1,350 there in that first two weeks, and I was just like, wow, I'm not sure that was worth it. Uh, you can apparently use affiliate links there, too. Uh, I didn't try. It, they seem to help, uh, but I had, had a much better click-through ratio. You know, I had like 4% CTR when I did my uh, Ruby series the summer before the sci-fi romance. And I was like struggling to get one 1.5% 1 on this fantasy series. It, it, you know, and I usually try like six ads or so to see which ones work best and uh, keep the good ones going and pull the other ones early. And that's when I did here, but I just didn't have any that performed the way the sci-fi romance did. And it, it just, maybe that's the audience, maybe that's the genre, maybe they see less sci-fi romance on uh, BookBub, so they're more interested in it. I, I don't know, couldn't tell you. But so the total was $3,150 in advertising. And like I said, spend about 8,000 in covers and editing for those first four books. So that's obviously I'm way ahead. Uh, January, February, also good. Uh, so, you know, that's about 150,000 earnings minus those expenses. So nothing to complain about. And of course, I put about four months into writing the books. Uh, so yeah, I'd be totally thrilled if I did that every time. Doesn't always happen. <laughs> I'd be thrilled if I did that ever. Yeah, well, there you go. This is only the second time that I've come close to that. My, my other good launch was the Fallen Empire series. That book bub for 1300 was that just one book bub? Book bub, book bub the ads. And I did the paper uh, CPM. So you're paying per thousand impressions, which I, next time I want to try the paper click, which I, you know, cause otherwise you're just paying to show it and not get clicked. But so that was like several ads that I had running the, you know, the thing at the bottom of their newsletter, not the sponsored, you know, we all want it. The sponsored stuff is great if you can get it, but it's hard to get, right? So they have these PPC ads. You can be at the bottom of the newsletter and some people do well with them. I find you can, like I said, spend a ton and I've certainly got clicks, but not as, as well as I've done in the past. So I, I ended up turning it off earlier than I might have otherwise. So uh, that's about all. I would say, so just if you're thinking of like, okay, I don't have 3,000 to spend, where's the best way to spend my money on my launch? For me, in Epic Fantasy Swords and Sorcery with a dragon on the cover, AMS ads were the best for the money. And I, this is the first time where I did like four or five different AMS ads and wrote different copy. And some of them I targeted authors, some of them I targeted like the keyword, just the generic fantasy genre. 
Um, but, you know, like two or three of them did quite well, picked up, showed a lot of impressions. And with those, you're not spending a fortune. So that's where if I had to do it again and I was on more of a budget, I would put my money into that. But it, it can be different, genre dependent, book dependent, because um, I definitely found last summer with the Ruby books that Facebook performed decently well on those and uh, the book club PPC ads did well or CPM ads so many initials guys <laughs> they did well in that genre and then I had no luck with the AMS ads and even um, I've gone back since then and tried to do that book one in the sci-fi romance series on the Amazon ads it's only 99 cents it's got a beautiful man chest on it and like space so it should hit all the right buttons for sci-fi romance people but that one never you know, maybe I just, I'm worse at writing copy on the sci-fi romance. <laughs> it's totally possible. But that's about all I have to say on that. Joe, do you have any questions? Jeff bailed on us to do <laughs> dog stuff. Um, just, uh, you see, AMS is, is most effective. And obviously, if you're uh, exclusive, then that's going to be, you know, the most useful anyway, because it's targeting specifically the platform it's sold on. Do you feel like if you were wide, you would still be putting money into AMS as preferentially? Or do you think that if you had the other storefronts to try to push as well, you'd put more on Facebook and BookBub? That's a good question because I've heard people say, you know, we actually had Patty Jensen on here. This is not quite the same thing, but she was saying how she was advertising to South American or not South American, South African people, English, uh, you know, reading folks and nobody advertises to them. So it was very uncompetitive and I could see that. Um, because the thing with AMS right now is it's only Amazon in the U.S. It was actually, I think I talked about it briefly before, but it's kind of interesting seeing how the book launches went on the non-U.S. site. I felt like it was a lot easier. I think I got as high as 51 in the Canadian store. And I was under 100 in the Australian store because you don't have all these people doing the AMS ads and you probably have fewer people targeting them with Facebook in those specific countries. So I'd actually say like right now, the opportunity maybe if you just, if you don't have thousands to spend is just kind of target spend and maybe try to get some of the international fruit. Can we call them fruits? Low hanging fruit. <laughs> and you know, I haven't done a lot on AMS with my wide stuff. So you would get more honest uh, A cost though. I forget, average cost of sale, I think is what uh, that stands for because Kindle Unlimited isn't factored in there. Right now, the way it stands, they only tell you if you got sales, so you're kind of guessing on reads. I, I do say don't do it. I mean, I, I do it at 99 cents for a book one, but you're gonna lose money no matter what advertising you're doing if your book's only 99 cents. Somewhat KU offsets that, because like I said, I made like 8,000, in KU page reads on that book one or 10,000, whatever it was, versus selling it for $1,600, $600 for 5,000 sales in the US. So you understand if you have wondered before why all these like contemporary romances are 99 cents out there, but they're also in KU. Now you know, they, they're not making that much on the sales, but they're making a lot on the page reads if there's a lot of page reads. But I, I have never had launches like this without outside of KU, so, and it's really, it's such an advantage to be in there on Amazon. And I, I love the other stores, but the income for me is so much less that even when I sell really well, like after a book bub, like right now I'm doing great on a book, uh, Barnes and Noble, cause I had a book bub for a free box set in January also. It still pales in comparison to just what the same books are doing on Amazon. So it's tough. I, I feel like with Facebook though, and we've talked about this, I know some people really nail it and, and do have some good luck, but I feel like people aren't there to buy books. So you're always fighting that. You're kind of trying to grab their attention away from whatever words with friends or <laughs> that's on the phone. I know, but you know, whatever game they're playing in Facebook or they're just chatting. And so it's tough. And I would listen, go back and listen to the show we did with Michael Cooper because he's someone that's made it work. Mark Dawson obviously has put a lot of time and effort into it and really has figured out what works. So uh, for me, I just don't love it that much that I'm that passionate. I'm way more excited in writing the next book than I am in figuring out exactly <laughs> what thing I can do to earn 2% more on this ad. All right, you have any more uh, random things you want to say, Joe, or shall I, I could jump into questions? I don't know, Jeff got eaten. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think I got anything else for this, so I guess we can start moving into questions. All righty, we have quite a few, as I mentioned, so hopefully these will be helpful for multiple people. 
Uh, first one I've got, I've actually got a few here from Kevin that have been sitting in my box since November or December. So I'm going to ask all of Kevin's questions. I, I think there's some pretty good ones. First one is, do you have any tips on increasing your open rates with mailing list newsletters? I'm currently at between 30 to 35% open rate. Do you want to go first? Um, well, yeah, my first opinion is 30 to 35% isn't terrible. Like if you look at the line that they put on, uh, on, uh, MailChimp, like 25% for like artists and stuff is pretty good. Um, uh, I want to say that it comes down a lot to how you build your list. If your, your list is entirely organic, you're going to have a lot of higher uh, open rate. Uh, but also more to the point, keep in mind that a high open rate is nice, but if you have a lower open rate, but a much larger list, that still equals more people. So depending on what your goal is, obviously a higher open rate means that you're getting more bang for your buck in terms of what you're spending on your newsletter. But if you're just looking for raw number of people, then, you know, 30% with a, a, a 10,000 list is better than 90% on a 1,000 list. Are you sure? Do I have to get my calculator out? Or <laughs> uh, yes, because 1,000 okay. list is maximum of 1,000, of, of 1, whereas 30% of 10,000 okay. is 3,000. <laughs> Sounded good to me. <laughs> but, you know, I can nod and just be like, wait a minute. Let me check that math. Um, yeah, I agree. If you're open, you know, I tend not to worry about open rates so much as uh, how many books I actually sold when I <laughs> sent out a newsletter. But I did curiously look, go look at mine. Um, I have three newsletters, one for my pen name, one that's my name, science fiction focused, and it's a newer list that I started when I started my Fallen Empire series. So less than two years old. And then I kind of have the fantasy-ish catch-all list that I first put up on my website, a form like in 2011 that was like, if you care, <laughs> sign up, <laughs> you know, like I'll tell you maybe when there's a, a new release or something, there are no perks, no bonuses, anything like that. And uh, so my open rates were the best with the sci-fi or the pen name list in the 60s. And that's about up to about 3,000 people now. And it's, um, you know, it's probably like three years old, but most of those came last summer. I think it was only six or 700 people. And then I released the Star Guardian series and I uh, gave away a free novella for people to sign up. So signups got boosted in that one. And, and that has my best. I, I kind of feel like when your list is smaller, it's more likely you're going to have a higher open rate. And then sort of the longer, not only the more people you have, but the longer your list has been going on. Cause I got people that have been on my original list since like 2011 <laughs> and they're probably just like, ah, another email from Lindsay, <laughs> who cares, <laughs> but they don't not care enough to unsubscribe. So that old list has only about in the forties for the open rate. And then the newer sci-fi list is up to about 10,000, 11,000 people. That's probably my best list where I did it the most right. There's, you know, there's a prequel novella that's exclusive to it, or it was for a long time, and they had to sign up to get to get it. And that one's in the 50% open rate. And these are kind of, for the most part, I've only gone after people who are fans, rather than uh, like Insta freebie, uh, trying to get people uh, before I know that they're going to like my stuff. So I would expect a much lower open rate if you got readers from like giveaways and there's nothing wrong with that. Just realize that they're not buyers until they buy something. <laughs> I'm extra logical tonight. <laughs> so, but um, as far as tips on increasing your rates, I actually don't notice a whole lot of difference when I play around with the headings, but I usually say exactly what they're going to get. Like I try to tell them the thing they're going to get by opening the letter. So that I don't go like vague, oh, free surprise inside, <laughs> you know, I feel like that's going to get you in people's spam <laughs> filters. I usually say like, oh, here are your bonus scenes, or here's a new short story or new release. And I, I try to make it not hypey, but, you know, meaty, so they know what they're going to get inside. Um, Jeff's back. Would you like to chime in, Jeff, on like, do you have any suggestions? Have you tried anything to increase your open rate for your newsletters? I've experimented with, you know, subject line, subject matter, and my best rates, yeah, as you're mentioning, I haven't really noticed much difference either when it comes to like, I'll try, try some of the spam lines. Must open now. Do not discard. Never works. Trust me. Um, yeah, I find I get the best, you know, best results with, as you're saying, just tell them what, what to expect. You know, new mystery story available, new, sh new fantasy short story here, or, or, you know, starting up graphic novel, interested in some scenes, you know, Got, got free scenes or something like that. Just as long as you're honest with them, you tell them what to expect and 
fluff it up a little bit if you can without sounding too cheesy or spammy. It usually works pretty well. Yeah, if you've actually got something free, like you did a new free short story or some free bonus scenes or something, I would definitely put free in the header. That's worked for me, and I've, <clears throat> I've actually been surprised it's worked. Like, I thought by putting free in the header, I might automatically, like, trigger spam filters just because it sounds spammy, but it hasn't been the case. Those tend to be my most opened emails. Very effective keywords, free. <laughs> right, and like I said, I do watch that because I'm kind of afraid that I've ended up in people's spam or gosh, I had one, I think I mentioned on the show where I had my story was called like combat support. And there were just a couple things in there that must have triggered something. And I got, not only did it go into like a filtered thing on Gmail, but they got an alert. Like you may be, this may be a suspicious sender. So be, be careful, <laughs> whatever you do put in there. All right, guys, next uh, kind of next question. I, I guess we kind of asked this, but what kind of subject lines do you use for your newsletters, generic or highly specific? Yeah, for me, I say I've tried both ways. Generic doesn't really work too well. Uh, granted, it's not the most significant change, but when I, when I try highly specific, but I get better rates when I do highly specific. So I, I like I said, I just tell them exactly what the whole point of the, the message is. It's, hey, I'll just release new fantasy for all you all you fantasy lovers out there or i'm um, just involved in another box set if you're interested click here i mean keep it short and sweet to the point and and try if you can fluff up a bit oh if you like a good fantasy you know got a got a got a free one going on now so see what they do and usually it works for me anyways for me yeah i tend to go pretty specific like it'll just be the book of deacon newsletter colon new release today or you know uh new uh, free newsletter perk today just very just straightforward here's what you're going to find inside if i i the, my newsletters are normally two story newsletters so sometimes i'll help mention both stories so like uh, a newsletter perk and a new release but it, i try to keep it relatively short so it just doesn't end up with a dot 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 and they don't even know what the second half of it was <laughs> Right. I, I say specific too. I feel like generic is more likely to get you in spam folders. If they see your name and the heading and they like you write to them every month or every few weeks, they probably remember who you are. But if it's been a while and they read a lot of authors, you know, they could just be like, what? No, I don't want to enlarge anything of mine. I'm a spam. So next question for acx users can you think of any ways to promote your audiobooks and i believe my notes here says i'm all ears seeing how i'm close to finishing my first two so let's see what you guys have to say uh well my point on it is basically it's tricky uh because you can't do anything with the price so uh with no price discounting you're mostly down to things like cross promotion um i've heard of people doing a thing where it's like whatever you show me a receipt or something like that, that you bought the audio book and I'll give you the ebook for free or something. But I don't know how really effective that'll be because, because of the amount of manual intervention required. Uh, so, I mean, again, I think cross promotion sort of thing or, or like just trying to get other people and, and, and uh, all the standard group author stuff is probably your best bet. Yeah, for me, it seems to rise and fall based on how well the actual ebook is selling. Uh, I know a lot of people are excited about these other opportunities coming along for audiobooks, specifically because you can lower the prices in other stores uh, with Audible, especially since they went to WhisperSync now is like $7.49 instead of $1.99 with the ebook. I, I used to make a lot more sales on like a book one where the book was free or 99 cents and the audiobook was $1.99. So that was really a bummer when they changed that. Um, one thing I have done on my free box set, Dragon Blood box set, which happens to be my best-selling audiobook of all time, is that at the end of it, I said, "Hey, if you enjoyed the ebook, you can get the audiobook here for one credit." Like all three, emphasizing that all three are in the audiobook for the box set. So I don't know. I. I actually need to go back and look. I can't remember if I used a tracking link. If I did, I never went back and tracked it. So that's effective, right? This is what happens when you get to the point where you have 50 odd novels. <laughs> You're just like, I have no idea what the back matter is on anything or if I use tracking links. But so it may just be a coincidence that one, uh, you know, as a three books for one audiobook, one audiobook, one audible credit. Uh, that may be why it's done well. But you know, it doesn't hurt. Uh, if somebody got the ebook for free and they liked it, uh, I've definitely bought and bought and bought as myself purchased as a reader. If I enjoy the book, I've often purchased the audio audio book 
just that's just one person's habits. But I, I know I actually don't like to get audiobooks uh, if I'm not familiar with the author and the story, because I've gotten bored a lot of times with audiobooks, and I'm like, well, that was a waste of 15 bucks. So I'm more likely to buy one I've already read. All right, do you guys have any more thoughts on that? Nope, none for me. Okay, how much is left in that bottle of wine? Lots, you wanna come over? Uh, how about tips on how to get more sales in the UK, Canada, or Australia? Let's see, my notes on this I put, <clears throat> look for online book clubs in those areas. You can contact the moderators, offer them either you know free copies of your books or else severely discount counted copies. I mean, you're looking to get your toe in the door there. I mean, offer them a deal on your entire series, your series starters there. And then when they're hooked, you can start raking in the sales. Uh, I, I've, I did that to a, a couple of UK clubs there. And I think one, I was ignored uh, Two, the other one. I think they made it as a book of the month type of thing there. I noticed a, a bump in sales that particular month. So it helps, but that's probably the first thing I would do. Um, well, first, in general, uh, UK, Canada, and Australia are three places that sort of can uh, tolerate higher prices, which is not going to make you make more sales, but just sort of be aware of that you can do it. More so UK and Australia. But uh, so there's that. Like, you get more bang for your buck on those sales if you price accordingly. Uh, also, I mean, keep in mind that you can target certain ads and certain promotions to those locations. Uh, if you're lucky enough to be on the radar of like getting an iBooks um, uh, rep that, that's willing to do promos with you, um, they there are regional promos and those can really, really help. The success of my steampunk book, Free Wrench, is largely because it got an Australia-New Zealand promo and ended up sticking in Australia and New Zealand for quite a while. So, I mean, it's it could be as simple as just targeting those uh, uh, audiences when you do ads or when you seek promos. Yeah, and I feel like this is one where being wide, of course, is, is really going to be helpful. Of course, there are Amazon, Australia, Canada, UK, and I, I sell in those stores, but um, I feel like, the like Joe was saying, the Kobo, like Smashwords, Drafted Digital, Apple, they're kind of looking for people. So if you can get on somebody's radar, and maybe it's just going to a conference near where you live or, or that you've been wanting to go to for a while where these guys have reps. Sometimes they, like Barnes and Noble will just have a list like, yeah, sign up here if you want us to email you about uh, opportunities in the future. Uh, so it's not like you have to be an expert networker or anything like that. And that, you know, they want to find cool people to promote. So of course having a great cover and that kind of thing. But, you know, I don't think I've ever had too many or any, I don't know, like big promos, like uh, a Joe is beloved of uh, <laughs> iBooks. <laughs> and um, I feel like, but I've gained fans just by being around for a while, being wide with most of my stuff. Uh, you know, we say this a lot, but book one free still really does work. Uh, and in the other countries, it works well too. Uh, some of the promo sites, of course, BookBub does international stuff. Uh, you can target the like India even with the PPC ads if you <laughs> if you want to. That's tough because the books tend to sell for so little there, and and I don't think the ads are necessarily any less money. But um, and then if you do want to try, like I noticed, I said that I made it up to fifty one, I think, in the Amazon Canada store. That was like ten sales a day and ten borrows a day. So we're not talking about huge numbers. So you could just decide, hey, you know, I'm in Canada. I'm going to try to use Facebook and target Canada and see if you can get maybe sticky in, in that particular store for your release. And I, I think we'll, we will see more of people trying to make more international sales because it is getting tough in U.S. Amazon store to, uh, to stick. There, there are so many people that are spending a lot on advertising, which is fine. <laughs> it's totally legitimate. But, you know, realize that if you don't have that budget, you're kind of fighting against that. And so, hey, maybe it's going to be easier over here in Australia or the UK where fewer people at this time are uh, targeting those guys. All right, you guys, any tips on how to sell more paperbacks? Uh, my notes on this one is, uh, I just say, I currently have a few titles. Uh, so I'm looking at one. Honestly, drop the price of your paperbacks as low as you can get it. You know, one of our more recent guests advertises to just drop the expanded distribution. I mean, if you have it through CreateSpace. And because uh, I started thinking about it, I was like, I've made a couple of sales through the expanded distribution, but not much. So out of curiosity, 
I dropped it out and I noticed I was able to drop it. I think my, my fantasies were going for like 12.95 and then since I dropped them to 9.95 under the $10 mark there. And the same thing with my mysteries. I dropped that from, I think it was like 10.95 to like down to like 8.95 or something. Sales of the print editions jumps by about 40%. I mean, it's, and so far each month is just doing amazingly well. So I'm like, and I'm pretty sure that is the only reason is people just like, you know, the lower price there. So and I still make a little bit from each one. So I would say do that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that was one of the things that, that we learned from the Oregon coast thing too, is if you pull expanded distribution from create space, you can usually drop your price by two or $3. And if you use Ingram spark, they will distribute to all the places that expanded distribution from create space used to. And you can usually match the price if you fiddle with your discount rate. And uh, so you end up with the same amount of distribution for books that are cheaper and Ingram spark distributes to more independent bookstores and stuff. So uh, overall, yeah, I think the best thing you can do to sell more paperbacks is get the price down by getting out of extended distribution on create space keeping in mind that if you do do ingram spark there's some costs involved you can go completely free on create space but on ingram spark you're going to be paying i think 45 dollars for a listing and you have to have your own isbn but it's it's can be worth it it can pay for itself pretty quickly yeah i've actually been taking advantage of that tip uh i find i mean Slightly, I put my first two. For, I only put the first one, Dragon uh, Storm, in there when I launched it at the end of December there, just to see if anything happened. And I also um, there's codes out on the internet to get free coupons. Look up uh, Alliance of Independent Authors. I think they've got a like always got a free code up on their site, or, or just Google it. I've done two books now, and both times they let me use the free code. Uh, I do have some of my own ISBNs that I already bought back in the day, so I've just been using those. But, uh, you know, you can get a pretty good chunk of them if you buy them in bulk. And, and I think you can share them. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you could, like, go in with another author. And Yeah, the, st the information I don't think is assigned to the ISBN until you actually assign it to a book. So I think you can sort of resell them. Okay, so... And anyway, so I put it in that book one in Ingram Spark and uh, same thing I made it I was able to make it cheaper by not doing the expanded distribution. So that was a good tip. And uh, I sold, you know, they emailed me a little spreadsheet. I was like, oh, what's this? And I sold 82 copies of the book in January, which for me guys, paperbacks, maybe I'll sell like four or five, or, well, maybe up to 10 in a month, usually if it's before Christmas. So that was definitely the most, of course, it was selling well on Amazon, so people were seeing it, but I'm kind of guessing maybe some bookstores or uh, libraries surfing the top 100 in fantasy or whatever uh, saw it and ordered it. So I went and put the second one in, and we'll see what February ends up being. I'm, I'm probably too lazy to go back and do my whole backlist, but I, I'm thinking I should do this going forward, because I, I definitely do have people that ask for the paperbacks, so that's why I do them, but they've never been a moneymaker for me. It's been more of a convenience to the fans, and it's fun to have something to sign if uh, <laughs> you ever meet somebody. But, um, oh, and also go back, if you haven't listened to it, we had an episode with Russell Nolte, Nolte, where he makes a living selling his physical books at conventions. And, you know, he had some, I thought, good tips for those who are more emphasizing selling the physical copies. All right, next question will be from Cadence. What are your thoughts on using Wattpad as a marketing platform? Would you recommend it? I've uh, tried using it. I haven't really noticed any bump in anything from doing that because I've, I've got a couple of titles I've put on there, you know, posted one chapter a week, you know, blogged about it, you know, put Facebook posts about it, everything. Haven't really noticed too much with it. So if there's maybe there's something I'm doing wrong or something I should have done in a different order, I'm not sure. But for me, eh, I didn't really think it was worth it. Yeah, I, I experimented with Wattpad for a while. Um, I have two of my free books up that I put up chapter by chapter uh, there. And I also, there's a, the, the book between that I wrote started off as a, just a weekly chapter that I was putting up and eventually I decided to make a novel out of it. Between got a little bit of traction, just people looking forward to the next chapter each time. But my overall experience with, uh, with Wattpad, keeping in mind, I did not put a tremendous amount of effort into spreading the word about Wattpad. The overall experience was that people on Wattpad aren't keen on moving on to a paid version of a story once they've got the free part. So the most common 
uh, comment or response I'll get from somebody who discovered, say, uh, Big Sigma series through Wattpad is, I really hope you continue this series, which is now five books deep. Just only the first one is on Wattpad. The rest cost money. So, uh, yeah, I, I haven't found them to be eager for, for non-free books. I've had a pretty similar experience. I haven't put anything up there for a while, but kind of early on, I put the first three Emperor's Edge books up there because why not? You know, I was just hoping that they'd come into the series and buy the later ones in the series. And I haven't found, I have had emails like Joe <laughs> from people that found the books. I mean, there's probably like 500,000 reads on the first one, which is minor when you're that's just like page hits you know across the, all the chapters but it's still like i don't know thousands of people checked it out at least and uh so mostly it's been people that are like i'm in x country and can't buy books online can i have the rest for free or like joe you know are you ever gonna write put more on wattpad so i would say probably gonna be tough i have of course heard that there's a big teen audience on there and if you're trying to reach the ya readers possibly but again they don't have credit cards, so are they going to become buyers? I don't know. Um, what you might, if you if you like the platform and you actually want to kind of do the networking and, and do the stuff that you should do in order to make buddies on there and get more views, um, there's nothing wrong with that. You could possibly get a review team out of it. That would kind of be how I would use it if I was thinking of using it and just starting out new as an author now, um, because you know those are people that probably on a limited income or don't have credit cards and would love to get your books for free. And if they're willing to post reviews, that's a good deal. So, but I wouldn't put a lot of effort into it unless you just think you got something that's going to appeal to the, <laughs> the teenage fan base. And, you know, I mean, they do like make movies and things out of some of the books that do really well on there. So, but like if you put, start publishing stuff on there and it doesn't seem to be doing that well, like I wouldn't definitely wouldn't spend money advertising it or, or do anything besides you know, tweets and, and Facebook plugs about new chapters going up. All right. Uh, oh, would you recommend adding an author page for, this is Cadence again, adding an author page for a new pen name if you already have an author page? I think that might be Facebook. She didn't say Facebook. Does that sound like, I don't think on Wattpad you get an author page, do you? I don't think so. No. You get a, you get a page, like a profile page. Yeah, I, I read that just you know, as just another profile page in general, for like Facebook or something else there. I can't answer this one because I don't have a, a different pen name. So I would assume you're answering this one, Lindsay. Oh, good. Yeah, I would definitely do another Facebook page for the pen name. And I did, um, especially if you want any anonymity between the two. But you have to be careful because if you're doing posting on your phone, it's going to show up as your name. <laughs> no matter, I've often answered Ruby posts about male chests and... Uh, I don't know what about with my name. And I'm like, well, there went that a uh, secret pen name. So, and then I've had my dad also post on the Ruby page. He just thumbs up everything and goes nice. <laughs> Even if it's a man chest, he just, I don't think he reads them. But anyway, um, yeah, but it lets you give a place to announce things. And if you ever want to run advertisements, boosted posts and things for your pen name specifically, then it, it's good to have a Facebook page for that. And if that question was for Wattpad, then probably the same thing. Have a different profile for your different pen names. It's not like the having, I wouldn't do different Twitter and really a whole lot of other social media stuff. It just gets to be a lot of work, but it's not too much work to have uh, separate pages there. All right, I've got a dog that's here wanting to be petted. So might be some clacking toenails in the background. But the next question is from Stephen. If someone lives in the UK, should he or she use American English for international releases or is British English acceptable for any non-British readers? I've always been under the impression that you shouldn't try to change the verbiage of your own works to try and do what you think the other people people expect. I mean, like, like, for example, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I mean, I don't want to assume that the reader doesn't know what the heck they read or not be able to figure certain things out. So, I mean, I read in English, I read British books all the time. I'm able to figure out the difference between lift and elevator. I mean, just, you have to assume your reader is a little smarter than that. So my own experience would be like, no, I, I deliberately will just leave it the way it is and your reader can figure it out. I don't think it's going to offend them, you know, if I don't tailor the words you know, over to that particular uh, language. Yeah, I don't know that there's going to be a tremendous amount of, of disappointment from American or Canadian readers when they find that the letter U has shown up in the word color. 
I, 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 speaking personally, I typically get pretty deep into a book before I realize this is not written in a localized fashion. Uh, I guess if you really want a rule of thumb, you and you're like you're making your decision at the very beginning, and you're confident that you can write in any form like that. I guess the rule of thumb would be to target the larger market, which would be American English. But I don't think it's going to be that big of a difference. I definitely wouldn't do another edition. Yeah, uh, if you saw as much as Harry Potter, then maybe it makes sense to have a special edition for the Americans who <laughs> will have a hissy fit if the words aren't spelled right. But um, I, I definitely saw when I was in a workshop with Australian writers, especially that they would have, we're not that smart in the US. We will think it's a typo if you spell realized with an S instead of a Z. We're just you know, until people become more exposed and realize that it, you just might have to accept that you might get somebody reporting your typos on Amazon and then you just email Amazon back and say, no, those are, that's how you spell color over here. So I wouldn't bother with it, but maybe somebody will try to correct your English. Sorry. <laughs> on behalf of my country, it's probably going to happen. <laughs> Uh, next question from Sean. I'm a seasoned author with seven novel length books in my trunk and I'm finally taking the plunge to create some stuff for Amazon. I'm interested in writing heroic fantasy slash sword and sorcery and I want to make sure my first series is the most efficient in terms of my time and money. I'm interested in doing shorter novels in the 40 to 50k range because I can easily produce those every two or three months and gain some momentum and visibility. I know 80 to 90k novels sell better but I could feasibly only produce two a year lowering my potential visibility which is the better way to start a writing career if my number one interest is in gaining steady readership oh, my notes on this one pretty much saying if you want to build your readership and increase your followers i would say just keep writing and releasing as regularly as you can so in your case do the 40 to 50k releases there because and then and that doesn't necessarily mean too you mentioned that your 80 thousand 80 80 to 9 thousand word novels sell better not necessarily. If you're looking from a KU point of view, possibly, but I, I think that you know the shorter novels can sell just as well as the longer novels too. So if you're just starting out, my own personal advice would be just keep releasing and writing as quickly as you can. That would definitely build your readership. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, all things being equal, putting more books out at a reasonable price point is going to be your better option. I mean, unless you're, you feel that you can price the 80, 90, thousand word book higher and there and, and make up for it there i don't know how many people are actually digging into how long a book is before they make a, a purchase as long as it's clearly a novel so again if you hit the fifty thousand word mark which i think is a pretty good threshold for what people would consider to be a, a, a you know comfortably into the range of novel or at least long for novella then yeah i think that's best uh, uh the rap rapid release is more valuable than better sales on longer books which are debatable it's interesting because we had Mark Coker on a month or two ago, and he mentioned that the best sellers on Amazon, or not Amazon, Smashwords on Barnes and Noble and Apple and such through Smashwords tended to be the longer books, over 100,000 words. So <clears throat> it's hard to say. I, you know, I'd usually just say, write the story, whatever is comfortable for you. I've certainly seen, especially in uh, romance, a lot of people doing the shorter stuff and, and killing it. You know, and I, <clears throat> I think it's going to depend on your stories. I feel like sword and sorcery, heroic, is uh, not quite the same as epic fantasy, and you're probably fine. You're probably going to have like one or two point of view characters. You know, I, I think of like Conan and Elric novels. They were all under two hundred or two hundred pages, I think, when they were paperbacks back in the day. <laughs> so I, I feel like that 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 particular subgenre is okay to go shorter. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't try to like rush things or intentionally make them short just so you can finish them and get them out there. Uh, you know, if one wants to go long, let it. <laughs> but th that's my two cents on that. All right. I think we're getting close to the end here. Andrew asks, uh, I'm a new author with no books released yet, though I do have the first two books in my trilogy written. My question is, what is the best way to get followers or a base before you have any released books so you can at least have some audience to pitch to when the release time comes. I have a Twitter account, a Facebook page, and a blog, but how does one actually go about getting followers? Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Me personally, I'd start offering them teasers, short stories, snippets, which don't give anything away. Maybe you know, obviously start up a mailing list and offer incentives such as you know, subscribers, exclusive short stories, 
offer them discounts for those who sign up for your newsletter and say like, Hey, I'm getting ready to release a novel somewhere down there. If, if you're a subscriber, you know, I offer deals all the time and just stuff like that is what I would say. Um, as for me, if you can come up with a short piece, like a, like a, a novella or something that you can use as a, as a, as a tool for building your list, that's, that's, could be useful. I ended up getting my list primarily out of the fact that I had a perma free full length novel. If you have a perma, perma free anything, you can probably end up getting something of a list out of that, or you can use that to give to people as an incentive to sign up. But then how do they find out about it is another issue. So there's, you know, you can be active on forums. There are some forums that let you self promote in that regard and, you know, just get friendly with groups of uh, authors in your genre but I would probably try to put together some form of either permanently free or incentive uh, uh, novella. Yeah, we've had people on, um, I think Dale Ivan Smith not that long ago, who did, I believe, a free prequel type of thing and put it on Insta Freebie and started getting a mailing list going that way so that when he released his first book, he did have some people and they had read the characters that the book was going to be about, so they had some interest in it to go out and buy the first book so that's a possibility just uh, giving away writing intentionally a prequel side story or prequel novella and giving that away to build a list to get people on there and then what I did when I did my pen name launch the very beginning this is now over three years old so it's not quite as a uh, <laughs> cutting edge or what people are doing now uh, I like you I wrote the first three books first and I made the first one free for a while um, and that really, you know, I think the pen name made like 10 or $12,000 in that first couple of months based on the sales of books two and three. Uh, so, and then, you know, and I bought a couple ads for the free book, but I think I only spent like maybe a hundred dollars total on advertising that, but it got a lot of downloads cause it was a new free book in that genre. So I think it's tough when you're first starting out to have the idea in your head, like, I'm going to make the first book free. <laughs> you know, like I know my first book took like seven years to finish uh, with the pen name. By that time I was like a faster writer and able to write those first three books. I mean, it's still effort. It still takes time to write. You know, I think they were all in the 90,000 word range. So giving away the first one free is tough, but I, I kind of look at the total income potential rather than just like, what can this book one earn? So those are a couple of ways. The free novella is less of an effort. So that, and then the, with the Insta freebie, you can collect email addresses from interested parties. So that can be a way to at least get a little bit of a mailing list going of people who are interested in your genre. And I don't know, I don't think you mentioned if you were going to jump into KDP Select or not. You know, it's easier to get people to borrow than to buy. So that helps, but uh, you know, nothing wrong with going wide. Uh, a lot of the Insta freebie readers, I think, are from different platforms, so they would actually maybe be disappointed if you went into Amazon exclusivity after that you got them all excited with your <laughs> prequel. Alrighty, last couple questions here, guys. These are from Jen, more writing stuff than marketing kind of stuff. So she asked, one, out of the protagonists you've written about, written about so far, which one do you feel you relate to the most? Well, in, in my case, you know, in the in the Bakken Chronicles, I created the protagonist Steve, literally based on me. It's one of the you know, first characters I ever created. I created my wife as the you know, character's wife in there. And a lot of my mannerisms, the way I you know, talk, you know, act and whatnot, description of me, that's all in there. So for me, it'd be him. Uh, for me, I guess uh, uh, Deacon of the Book of Deacon is probably the one I relate to most. He's not the star of the book, despite the fact his name is on it. Uh, he's more about being helpful to the people who are the stars of the book uh, than actually being a hero. And uh, he enters the plot with a full expectation of actually failing. So overall, his attitude is, is, is roughly equivalent to my own. Plus, technically, since it's the Book of Deacon and he's supposed to be the person writing the book, technically, as the person who wrote the book, he is the author insert character. So maybe a little bit uh, on the nose there, but there you go. All right. And, uh, you know, all of my characters, I would say, have a lot of my uh, special sense of humor <laughs> that comes out in a, a lot of them i've actually it's taken me 15 odd novels i've finally written a couple of short stories with the character that is very much me and i'm, I'm kind of like i'm a little afraid to do novels with them and actually try to promote them because it's sort of like if you don't like this you don't like me 
but I was never the popular kid, so it's not like it would be a surprise. Maybe I could win an award because the, uh, the hero is very autistic Asperger's type, <laughs> which I can write very well for no particular reason. So we'll see. Those are uh, sci-fi kind of space opera. Hero's a skip tracer. She's kind of uh, made her life without having to answer to anybody and, and mostly just lives on her ship and <laughs> talks to her android and her dog. I need an android and then it's me. All right, you guys, what is the hardest thing you had to edit out of a story? Last question. Uh, let's see. For me, I know there's a couple of scenes in the, one of my fantasies uh, uh, probably three or four releases ago where literally I, I had this thing down in my head exactly how I wanted it, and that was the argument that my wife and I had, full-blown argument in a restaurant where I grabbed every hot sauce thing I had. I, I'm plotting everything out on the table. This is this, this is this, this is this. Well, I was like, nope, that's not possible. And she was right. So I had to make a, make a change. So I had to suck it up and say, yes, dear, you were right. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> so that was tough. Uh, as for me, I don't end up editing a lot of stuff out of my stories. Frequently, when I do a second pass, it ends up adding stuff, which is an example of why my books tend to be a little bit longer than they're supposed to be. But I guess um, in the free run series, starting with the second book, uh, a relationship, the relationship starts to develop that is a same sex relationship. And I decided not to make it explicit until book four because I just was getting cold feet. So there were scenes that made it, that made it clear that this is the case that I ended up moving to, you know, moving down two books just because I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to risk screwing up writing that, that stuff. So technically it wasn't cut out, but it was postponed and it was a lengthy decision-making process to do it. I've definitely backed away from things where like, I thought they were fine when I'm writing them that my beta readers are like, this is completely not politically correct. Or, you know, you're going to offend this whole race of people or species race. What's the right word, right? We're races, right? It is the end of a long show, I guess. But, um, so, and I'm not the best judge of that kind of stuff <laughs> or any, like, so what's socially acceptable on any level. So I tend to nod and accept what the beta readers say and go back and, and change things. And sometimes that's hard because I feel like the character would kind of say that or be less than PC. But at the same time, I don't want to offend my readership for just a small thing. So I guess I've done that quite often. I couldn't really think of any huge thing with, when the question came up. I, I know when I originally wrote my first book, The Emperor's Edge, I mentioned it, <laughs> it took seven years. Part of that is because I didn't like the first ending. I got it all the way through a workshop and I was like, uh, this, this isn't right. And it was really hard for me to realize that I wanted to basically cut the whole, cut it all and go back and write the last two thirds. So like 30, 40,000 words. That's hard. <laughs> You know, that's a lot of time, especially I was much slower writer then. You know, I was like stoked if I got a thousand words a day. So that can be hard. If if you realize, you get to the end and you realize, ah, this sucks. I need to like just rewrite the whole ending. And so I've definitely had that happen before. Uh, a little less now. Outlining, I think, helps. <laughs> or just having written more novels too. I know some people listen and like, how, how can you write that many novels? And I thought that too. It's just, it gets easier as, as you do it more and uh, you get a little more efficient at it. So I guess that is a good ending point now that I've insulted everybody's species. Uh, <laughs> do you guys have anything that you want to plug before we go? Uh, from my end, um, it's like I said, sometimes I'm going to be working on a couple of box sets. I'm going to try and time to be released with the audiobooks. Uh, the guy continues to do fantastic work on my graphic novel. It's just a whole lot of stuff going on at the same time. So very exciting. Um, as for me, uh, again, today I put out the, uh, uh, the book is called Beta Testers. The series is called Big Sigma. It's a novella that was released today. The next uh, thing is also on pre-order, which is The Stump and the Spire, which is a big uh, a book of Deacon short story mini collection. It's two short stories in the book of Deacon series, one set early and one set late. So it's sort of a weird little bookend for the trilogy, I suppose. So that's, that's what I got to plug right now. All right, cool. And if you guys want to go see the me character, I actually, my most, most recent blog post is free fiction, paradise lodge, which uh, despite that title, it is science fiction. Although it's kind of, you don't have to be a sci-fi fan. It's kind of Was fantasy. Was that paradise too. with a P or paradise? No, paradise with, with a bear. Okay. okay. That's, 
what I thought you said. I was just yep, clarifying. Yep. I understand why uh, it might be confusing. <laughs> so that's on my blog at lindsaybaroker.com. You can go check it out. Uh, I think that's it. You guys have anything? Anybody know what episode this is so we can tell people? <laughs> well, 171? 171. Yep, yep. I just checked. All right. 171, guys, if you want to come by, it's marketingsff.com, and I'll throw the links to the things we just plugged in case you're curious. But if not, thanks for listening, and we will catch you next week with a real guest again. <laughs> All right. You guys, take it easy.